little Dave Matthews. Yeah. I like it. We are live. And today I have Amanda Douglas in the Keeping It Real Estate podcast. How are you, Amanda? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Um, if someone doesn't know, they're probably living under a rock. <laughs> but <laughs> you are the owner of Celebration Title. I am, yes. How's business? Business is doing great. Business is booming. Um, you gave me one of the biggest compliments that I received since I started doing this podcast, because oftentimes I'm asking people if they want to do the podcast, mm -hmm. but you came to me and you said that you wanted to come on the podcast, right? which it's incredibly flattering because it means to me that someone's listening. Mm -hmm. Maybe you are my only listener. I definitely watch them. I'm a faithful watcher. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and you also said that you wanted to come on the podcast for a specific reason. You mm -hmm. wanted to kind of go in detail and talk a little bit more about what could be construed as rumors that have been talked about about your companies mm -hmm. and the way you operate business. Yeah. So sort of in the spirit of transparency, you wanted to kind of lift the veil on oh, all that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the biggest thing that and kind of what we were chatting about right before we started the podcast was... Um, the the camaraderie that doesn't happen in the title industry the very it's a very competitive industry that most real estate agents don't know that happen on the back end and i think the biggest thing is that they kind of other title companies just see it as now there's great title companies i can't say that it's everyone but uh, when you hear rumors and you hear oh well you know there's no way they could have grown as fast as they've grown you know like bringing value that must be like a, a rare thing right to get business but they have to be doing things illegally and um, you know it just becomes one of those things that it's almost like a telephone game and uh, the most recent rumor I heard, which I thought was pretty hysterical, was that we're being investigated by the FBI. And this actually came from another title company owner to one of my real estate agents. And he called me immediately. And he's like, I can't believe this rumor is going around. And I'm like, honestly, it's one of, you know, 95 that I've heard in the last 90 minutes. So it just happens to be that we work in an industry that is crazy competitive, there's no FBI investigations. I mean, I guess I'm the last one to know about being investigated by the FBI. But, um, you know, there's just when you do things different, people come up with different ideas of how you got there. Why would the FBI investigate a title card? <laughs> it's an interesting one. It's a very interesting one. Again, it's like one of those telephone games, right? If, if any title company were to be investigated, it would be through... Uh, the DFS, so Department of Financial um, Services, and it would be some sort of RESPA violation. FBI, I mean, that happens to be like if a title company, like there was a recent title company in Orlando that um, a real estate agent called me about that got shut down like same day. Um, and it's like mismanagement of escrow funds, which honestly doesn't happen anymore in our industry just because I don't know if most people know, but title companies are um, actually audited nightly. So we're audited nightly. We have somebody log into our bank account. They look at all of our, our files. They make sure all the appropriate wires were placed. They review all of our checks. Like that has to happen in order. Some title companies are monthly. So there are some smaller companies that may only do 10 to 20 files a month that probably could get away with, you know, mismanagement of escrow funds. But it is not something that we even remotely play with. So the FBI is not investigating. No, you. they're not investigating us, unfortunately. I guess we're not that important. <laughs> um, RESPA, you touched on it briefly. Right. Any RESPA violations? No RESPA violations. Merit? We had a complaint, and I'll kind of tell you guys, um, we get uh, complaints probably weekly, and so do other title companies. And if I speak to my underwriter, they're like, if you're not getting complaints, you're not doing, you're not doing enough business. And it just so happens to be, again, goes back to that cooperation part of title companies in our industry is, it's so competitive. Oh my gosh, the recent complaint, I'll give you an example. It's a really funny one. Um, apparently a title rep went to an open house that we had given a basket under the $25, you know, the whole shebang that you can do. And there was no business card in it. And they actually took a photo of the basket and sent it to, um, send a complaint in based on us not having a 
business card in the basket. So those are the kind of complaints that I have to deal with in the phone calls. And it, it's actually pretty minimal. It's, it's so silly. The things, um, there's so many things to combat that, right? We have like branded, you know, champagne flutes. So of course we're promoting celebration title. We're not promoting the real estate agent. Um, there are so many ways to get around it. We've never had a fine. We've had several complaints about social media and that's the one area that I wanted to talk to you about because we're actually pushing a, um, in October, we got the DFS to come to Orlando, our underwriter, and I'm working directly with our rep on RESPA is so old. Like the regulations with RESPA, they just never change. And there's nothing written specifically about social media. Social media is a free platform. So how do you monetize social media and promotion for real estate agents? And how does that relate to RESPA? Yeah, and so what we end up doing right is when trying to interpret these old rules right. um, that apply to uh, publications and stuff like that and try mm-hmm. to relate them to social media. But it's it really is an area of need in all of real estate. Oh, you know, absolutely. A, a bit of an update mm-hmm. on um, what the advertising rules should be for social media and people's personal page versus mm-hmm. the business page and, and all of that. Right. Um when people talk about the RESPA complaints and the RESPA violations, I think the thing that people, I think the thing that most of us know of is like title agents, title companies can't be giving things to mm-hmm. agents. Are you giving people things? Are you gifting people to induce business? No, we're not doing that. So you can't give people things. There's, there's like a law of $25 and it can't be towards a specific transaction. It can't be to induce business. I can't hand you a $25 gift card and say, I'm only giving this to you if you send me a listing. That's an inducement um, in order to get business. Now there's different things you can do. You can sponsor events. You can just be in proximity and host events. That's the biggest way that we're able to attract business rather than induce it. And that's like our biggest thing is we are educators. We want to actually be out in the community. We want to build value to our real estate agents. Um, It's interesting because a lot of title companies look at it as being an assistant to real estate agents. And I don't see it from that perspective. I see it as agents are actually asking us to help. And if it's something we can help with by educating by being in front of people, by being in proximity, we actually attract business. We're not inducing it. Um, funny that you mentioned that a lot of agency, <coughs> the title companies as, assi- as assistants, I recently saw a title company advertising things like transaction coordination services for a significant discount to agents. Mm-hmm. So it definitely doesn't help the perception, um, right. I think, when type of stuff is going on it, I think it it just depends on how they're actually advertising it right so you can you can do any sort of things like that but you can't specifically say things like you can only use this transaction coordinating company if you use celebration title you'll only get this price now RESPA and you know I'm just speaking from a broad perspective RESPA can there's different cases that have been settled different ways um, we've gone through several RESPA complaints, so I've only um, stating it from a perspective of what I know and what I've seen because I've been entitled for 12 years now. So um, I've never, you know, seen anything that was that was pushed that way. So we don't do anything that's saying, hey, if you use this company, you get this massive discount only if you use celebration title. So we have partners that we definitely, you know, here's three great company. It's no different than from a real estate perspective when you guys hand out inspectors, right? right. Here's three great ones. If you use them, great. If not, you know, we ask, we get asked for referrals on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. And, and you would be because the title company is the one that touches everyone, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, the, you mentioned that you guys have had sort of an explosive growth. Can mm-hmm. you walk us through that a little bit, like the, sure. what the trajectories look like? Oh, my goodness. So we've been in business since February of 2016, so just a little over three years. And um, I first started, and I think it's interesting because a lot of people don't know that I started the company just by myself and one other person in a tiny, you know, 10 by 9 office that I was subletting in Championsgate. So started Celebration Title, I initially had two partners, 
um, that I started it with. One partner was an um, owner in a brokerage uh, locally in Celebration. So we kind of had, um, initially, I was in title long before. I was a real estate agent for about a year and a half prior to starting Celebration Title and got approached by a broker to open a title company. Um, And that's initially how it got started. I never dreamed it would grow as fast as it did. But um, as soon as people found out I was back in title and I was a closer before, so I'm not that owner of a title company that's never done every single job in our organization. So I know what every single one of my teammates go through. Um, So they immediately started wanting to send me business. Well, we were talking about this before where a lot of times uh, brokers utilize that as a way to recruit and it just... I wasn't feeling it from a perspective of my partners. So I ended up about six months in buying them out because I could see the explosive growth that was going to happen with Celebration Title and we weren't going in the same direction. So um, as soon as I became the sole owner, it just kind of exploded from there. So, And you think part of that is maybe associating with a brokerage before kind of makes other real real estate agents weary of giving money to their oh, competition. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it does. And I just had a different vision and direction. Like Celebration Title, a lot of people are like, oh, you're in Celebration. That's the one thing that I want to actually combat. It's like, no, the experience is a celebration. It's a scalable business. It's something that we drive passionately, that we fall in love with our clients. We don't ever talk about title insurance. No one really cares. So we make the experience something that's memorable for a moment that is memorable and it should be experienced that way. Um, You are probably one of the people, if not the one that has the strongest social media when it comes to title companies, at least on Instagram, which Mm -hmm. is where I spend the bulk of my time. Sure. Um, Tell me a little bit about the thought process behind sort of focusing on that so much for your business? Sure. So, um, you know, I constantly watch, you know, the celebration experience and doing all the closings. And um, I worked for Fannie Mae for a while. And I also worked for a local title company that was very uh, attorney driven, very dry closing. So I saw this opportunity when you would do a closing and you would uh, look at the buyers and they'd be like, that's like, that's it. And you're like, yeah, that that's it. Here's your key, you know, keep the pen. (laughs) And that was about it. And I could always see that they kind of wanted something more. They wouldn't ask for it. The real estate agents wouldn't really ask for it. And they're like, can I get a picture at least? And you're like, sure. Um, so I knew there's bad news when the client's asking for it, Yeah, when they're asking for the photo and, you know, my bosses at the time would just say, just keep, keep cranking the closing and just keep cranking, you know, just focusing on the money and not the people. And I always thought, what if we focused on the people? What if we really made the experience something that was memorable? You know, when you follow with passion and purpose, the profits will always end up coming. And that's something that I've always been super passionate about. I'm not a natural business owner. And most people wouldn't even know that I was super shy in school. I wasn't this person that was out there. So this whole like social media presence, all of it is very new for me. Um, but do you know, it's You're natural. I uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, if you ask my CMO, Erica, if the first time I hired her, she was probably instrumental in putting us out on Facebook and social media. Um, but the very first video she ever made me do, she's like, you are such a disaster. And I was like, I know I'm, I'm just not natural at this stuff. So if you give me a script, I will absolutely fumble and fall apart. Um, but if I talk with passion and I know, and I feel very comfortable about what I'm talking about, it comes across that way. Um, the interesting part about closings is that most people will look at it and say, there really is very little value in the, doing the celebration experience if you're if if you're just looking in your immediate vicinity because it's like these people just bought a house they're probably not going to sell it for years down the road and even if they do they're going to go with the title company that listing agent recommends mm-hmm. but you you sort of threw that all off the table and and you said it does not matter right we want to make it special because it should be a special moment mm-hmm. so 
you know, it's it's showing additional respect for the consumer. For oh, sure. absolutely. And I think by showing that additional respect for the consumer, what is the one thing that real estate agents are not that great at are continuing what we call continuing the celebration after the closing. Um, so just by having a memorable experience at the closing table, they're going to remember their real estate agent just a little bit more. Um, and I think that we help by, you know, actually generating more and more referrals we're an extension of the real estate agent in their service and if we can make them look even better then then why not with a simple little canon and video and nice personable people in the office and a nice homey atmosphere why it shouldn't take you know it's a, such a tiny tiny thing to make such a moment bigger than it than it you know is being memored at this point so being did you bring a canon with you I didn't. I should have. Oh, Dang it. Man. Oh my goodness. I don't you know, I don't really travel with them that much. <laughs> but when I when I do Pro- probably I probably not a good thing to travel <laughs> with a cannon. Because they're actually like almost like a firework at the bottom, so you can't leave them in your car, unfortunately. <laughs> it would probably be a good prank to leave one it in somebody's would. car. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to ship you one. I'm sure your kids would, or your daughter would like to do it. Yeah. Um one of the things that I think you guys also do well is it seems like you are hiring a lot of rock stars in your company. What's mm-hmm. your approach to that? How do you approach these people? Why are they coming to you? Sure. So, well, I think the biggest thing, and we kind of touched on it earlier about the social media presence. Um, the one thing that I saw was that there are no title companies on social media. And if they are, there's just no presence, right? It's very boring and dry. And no one cares about these documents that you're getting from your underwriter that you're posting. Like, what are the ID requirements for closing? Like, just doing something different. Um, and so what I've done is I hired a CMO and I got a marketing department in place that helped me kind of push where I could recruit rock star salespeople that di- weren't necessarily good at marketing because I think those are two different things. So like sales and marketing to me, um, somebody could be an insane person on the phones and they absolutely cannot do a flyer to save their life or they just don't want to take the time to do it. So when I split up those two different departments and I got a marketing department and a growth hacker department that support my growth s- hacker. Yes. <laughs> we got to, we got to talk about that. Title. I know, I know it's, it's so good. Um, so this, it's going to stem a whole growth department and expansion team for, you know, r- for my title company, because, you know, we're not stopping in central Florida we're definitely continuing to grow. But um, once I got that support team in place, the sales team, they were coming to me. I mean, it's very easy to see sales reps in, you know, Central Florida. And you're like, how in the world are you going to all these open houses? How are you going to all these events? How are you actually still getting sales and delivering escrow checks or whatever it is you're doing? Um, What if you had just a tiny bit of support you know, helping you with that and people that are actually in the office from nine to five and you could just go pound the pavement and get business. You know, what would that look like for your business to grow? Yeah, it's, it seems to me when I see it, it it's a grueling job. It is very grueling, yes. Um, because I see, you know, there is the understanding is title people, the title reps work nine to five on mm-hmm. Monday through Friday. But then I see a lot of them on open houses on Saturday and Sundays and they all go door knocking with people. And it's it's a big job. It's a big commitment. It's a huge commitment and it's not for everyone. It looks glamorous. Right. But it it's not. Um, So it looks like you're out at all these fun events. But at the end of the day, it's business. You have to convert those into actual business and contracts and you're not getting paid until it closes. So, you know, the title company's not getting paid till it closes. Um, but even from an operational perspective, I'll tell everyone I have absolutely never hired on experience. And I think that's probably something that sets us apart. I hire on personality. So I find I don't like post a job and I'm like, you can only be a junior processor. If I find an amazing person, I'm going to find a place for them in the organization. Um, so personality to me is everything. We have the most amazing team. We're now at 24 people, which is incredible. Yeah. So, and, um, out of the 24 people, 
only two came off of an actual job posting. So the rest were through social media, people I've met out in the industry that I just naturally liked and slowly recruited. There's someone listening to this who's the head <laughs> of some big brokerage <laughs> going like, hey, we need to go She's ahead. a silent assassin <laughs> taking <laughs> people. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get uh, Amanda on board for recruiting purposes. Yeah. Um, w- you said, obviously, you continue to grow. You have mm-hmm. how many offices now? We now have five offices. So we have three um, offices that are fully staffed. And um, then we have two satellite offices. So we're in Celebration, uh, Dr. Phillips in downtown. Those offices are all three fully staffed with our employees. Altamont and Daytona are two satellite offices. Um, and that's kind of how I built the business is I would put a satellite office. So Dr. Phillips, I had a tiny satellite office before we opened our large office. And I have a set goal amount of how many contracts I need every month for three months in a row. And then I'll start looking for a space to lease um, and doing the, that right now in Altamont. Daytona, we actually just moved into a full space. So I guess it's kind of a a full office office. now it's a real office and I've got um Robin out there in Daytona so she's she's killing it for us and when you go to what's your thought process on the satellite offices do you just go um where you already have some relationships where your reps have relationships Mm -hmm. or where you see an area of opportunity because perhaps the title industry is not serving that area well Right. So it's definitely an area of opportunity, one. And then it's always I find a sales rep in that area that I slowly recruit and um, I get them to, you know, bring the business in. Everything processing can be centralized. You know, people don't need to actually physically be in an office. um, But in order to have a brick and mortar in a county for actual closings is super important. It doesn't need to be a huge fancy space. And it's actually worked out for us having the processors and closers all kind of in one office working together. Yeah, that seems to be a model that's it's becoming more and more popular mm-hmm. because you have the people, sort of the operations in one spot mm-hmm. and you don't have to have that operation on every single office exactly. for the thing to function. Exactly. So, and we've kind of, you know, I've worked in title for, you know, 12 years. I've seen a lot of operations and I've, learned a lot of things I didn't want to do and a lot of things I did want to do. Um, But I've broken down the process quite differently than most title companies. So you've got normally the processor closer positions. We have a lot more support in there, just like I built the support into the sales team. The operations team has a lot more support with some of the monotonous, you know, tasks on a daily basis with a junior processor. Then we have a processor we have a closer. Um, sorry, I won't bang on the table. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I'm a hand did talker. I, did, did I give you the dad look? <laughs> you gave me the look, like, stop doing that. You're fine. But, um, but then we have the closer. So the one thing when I was a closer that I got the most kickback on was um, I was always in the closing room. So, and when you call into a title company and they're like, you got the CD 35 seconds ago, let me have that turned over right now. And well, they're in a closing for another two hours, right? So I pulled the closer out of the closing room. So the closer is fully just cranking out CDs and closing packages all day. And they're available for phone calls, questions, fully licensed. Um, so they're answering all of the, quest- the questions by the real estate agents because the one pain point I got from most agents, you know, because I did a lot of questioning like what are you looking for in a title company what should I do and I'm always changing the process based on feedback from agents and it was communication it's always communication so once I pulled them out of the closing room and I put what we call a closing specialist or experienced specialist in the closing room somebody with a very high eye personality that's very energetic that can actually, once you get to the closing table, you just need somebody that's funny, energetic, that wants to crank it out and really provide that experience. And that's normally not the personality type of a closer. So that was an, a thing that has taken us to the next level for sure. Yeah, you are absolutely correct. There is very few things l- more anticlimactic on a closing than having, I've experienced it a lot with some of the mobile closers where they right. just kind of show up and they're like, yeah, it's like <laughs> sifting documents and it's like, all right, all very matter of fact. And sure. And, and for a lot of people, 
most humans, you stick 100 pieces of paper in front of them that they're going to have to sign without mm-hmm. really an opportunity to read them thoroughly. It's an intimidating moment. It is, yes. Add someone that has sort of the demeanor of the, the clerk at a driver's license office. Right. And it became just a much more um, nerving experience for them. Exactly. That doesn't need to be. Exactly. And that's kind of how um, I thought, how can I make the clients feel so much more comfortable? Real estate agents and their buyers and sellers feel more comfortable when they come into a closing. So it's, if you haven't been in one of our offices, they're like built out like Chip and Joanna Gaines, very farmhouse chic, something you wouldn't normally see in a title company. Um, I don't want people walking in the door automatically on the defense, like, oh, this is where all my money went in a high rise, like attorney building, you know, and it just kind of breaks them down. I've sold probably 95 of the dining room tables that we close on from Wayfair. And I'm like, it's just, it's a comfortable environment with somebody who's funny. Um, I train all of our closing specialists and uh, you can ask all of them. We have a script that has jokes written into it. It's like, you just have to be lighthearted. These people have likely been through a very stressful 45 days, 30 days, whatever it may be. Um, but you know, read your situation. We do a lot of personality trainings and stuff like that. So it's read the situation, know when you can be funny, know when you need to be serious and just treat the client as if, um, they're your own family. Right. Because that's the opposite of another spectrum. The opposite of another spectrum. And I've experienced it too, is when someone has that naturally mm-hmm. joking personality right. and the room is not for that. Like yes. this is a. <laughs> sad situation for like a divorce situation oh, or whatever. for sure and the closer is like trying to make light of it and it's mm-hmm. like shut the fuck up yeah oh absolutely so we have this um thing where we have to relay their kind of story to the closing specialist before the clients get there so we understand if it's been a death or a divorce and it may not be so jokey and laughy they may not want to do the celebration experience um so i think there's always a moment in time how you can handle those situations and those are things that we always work through Uh, the biggest thing with my team again hiring on personalities everyone in my organization are so even keeled and so good with tough situations i think that is the one thing that sets us apart is we can diffuse you know, a really tough situation. That's something that I'm super passionate about. It's just staying calm, like not being overly excited, not being blah either. And like, you know, just learning how to deal with the situation at hand. Not becoming fuel to the fire. Exactly. Exactly. Because I know you've been in situations, right, where people will constantly keep asking questions. You're like, can you please just stop? Just, you know, like you should be able to read the situation that's happening. Yeah. That's something that doesn't get taught enough Right. Um, In any business, I think. Well, and I think that just goes straight back to I never look at myself as a boss because I think bosses just want you to have a good job and a good career. I'm a leader and I want my team and I want all of their families to really prosper and be better people. Yeah. And just going back to the personality training, I think that's something that's it's been a huge disappointment of mine that it doesn't happen more across the across the real estate world because out of all the trainings that I've ever gone to, which is a lot, yeah. um, learning about just being able to pick up personality traits, the disc, and um, just the way people are dressed, the way their furniture is arranged, you mm-hmm. know, that's kind of, that was the way that it was equated um, to real estate agents, like pick up the people's personality when you walk in the house. Right. And, and so it's it's been very helpful for me. Oh, uh-huh. sure. And it's been very helpful for me for two reasons. A, it allowed me to understand why, you know, oftentimes I was um, drawn to not like people right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Because when you understand your personality type, um, now you can understand where your flaws are. And for me, it's that I'm like a 95% D. Um, So, you know, I, one of the biggest problems with people that are high Ds is they have a hard time understanding people who think differently than them. Right. The big moment when you are someone that feels like people are trying to confront you or combat you all the time. And oh, so, absolutely. Um, so the funny thing is the more often that I take the disc profile test, my D keeps going down and my I goes up and my SC go up. And I don't know if it's a function of being older or just a little more That's so um, funny. intuitive into right. what my flaws are naturally. That's so funny. So we actually do the disc profile with my sales team and we just redid it 
yesterday. So it's so funny. We were reading through them and I'm a very high D. Well, most people would think I'm a much higher I than I'm a D, but I think it's because I've learned how to kind of minimize it in situations. People don't like D's, so they we don't gotta like turn it D's. Off. And then I read my disc profile. I'm like, God, I'm an asshole. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's important. It's not to, coincidence that the letter is D, right? I know, I know. And then there's some things you read like you should have your own parking space, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, but it's important. But my eye has definitely like my eye naturally is very high and my D or my eye is naturally very lower, much lower. But now it's like increasingly going up because I think I'm being more comfortable around people and like being more patient and um, being more empathetic and having 24 employees and a huge team understanding all of their personalities and learning them and how to talk to them. Uh, Cause I think it's important. I still like to sit with each one of them and have one-on-ones and I personally hired everyone, but two in my organization. So I kind of get that mom guilt, but yeah. for your team. And um, it's interesting that, you know, you can kind of minimize that D personality sometimes. Yeah. And I, and I attribute it not in small part to the fact that, you know, all my personal relationships became much better once I understood mm -hmm. personality types. Um, because like you say, I mean, being a high D is basically being an ass. My yeah. actual, my personality profile, the first time that I took it, uh, my top three is D-I-C. So I was literally a dick. Yeah, I'm and a D-I-C too. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, and so so it's funny because I remember coming home and telling my wife, I'm like, honey, this is my personal life profile. I'm at DAC. She's like, yeah, well, sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, um, I think it's interesting too. And like, um, being a female in the industry and being a D, uh, personality can come across as being a, a bit aggressive and, you know, having that masculine kind of, uh, vibe, I guess you could say. I don't uh, think anyone would accuse you. No, that. no one would accuse me, but I think that's just a general on paper kind of viewpoint. Um, and I think it's so funny. You actually did a pod talking about females in business. You did a podcast and, uh, it's something, uh, my team, like you were said something about combating it being like a title agent, like a title girl. When anybody says like title girl, I like, I cringe. I hate that sure. word. And it's like, um, there was somebody that's not the normal, like blonde hair, blue eyes, like out and about dropping off cookies. Like I definitely empower my sales team to be, learn your personality, learn what you're good at, learn what value you bring. And we're more than just like a cookie drop off kind of title girl, more or less, or title male. Um, but I think it's something that we've tried to combat in the industry is like bringing more value outside of being a male or a female or whatever it is that used to work in the industry, going out and buying drinks and all of that stuff. It's so more than that. So you think, um, so you think part of the reason why that is a stereotype and mm -hmm. it's not a it's not necessarily a positive one. Right. It's like a used car salesman. I always say that, like, I love yeah. used car salespeople. Right. But when somebody calls you that, normally it's not in a complimentary fashion. Oh, yeah. It's not at all. I just was talking to somebody the other day, and they were like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, title insurance. And like, oh, you're a title girl. And I'm like, not really. Yeah. But. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and in fairness. Yeah. Since you mention it, I will, I will tell you full well I re-listen to the podcast every single time, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I'll, I'll finish it and I'll re-listen to it. And I didn't really pick up on it the first time, but then I did. Mm -hmm. That I did say, you know, I used it in a way that it could have been better. Right. Like my words were a little clumsy. Right. And, you know, part of that happens when you're doing these things live. Oh, like sure. this is non-edited. I'm just yeah. trying to get the hang of it. But part of it is, there is that stereotype. And it I is, think, yeah. And, and I think it's something that, that you guys do well at breaking, um, mm -hmm. at breaking through that um, sort of barrier. And I think that's one thing that a lot of other title companies are, are being successful with, like trying, right. to, um, trying to provide value beyond having just the cookie drop off. Yeah, exactly. And so I appreciate you saying that because it is a stereotype and it's something that I don't like people just saying, oh, you're entitled because you're blonde hair, like you're a title girl. And I'm like, no, it's so much more than that. Um, and I saw that stereotype coming a long time ago, right? Where 
we should be a partner. We shouldn't be somebody who's just running around and dropping off cookies and saying hi and doing that. Not, not that cookie drop-offs are not great, right? It, it helps popping in and saying hi, but we have to bring more value than and combat that stereotype because we are, you know, business individuals. We are people that are partners to our real estate agents. We learn what they're good at. We learn where we can fill in those holes and help them out. And I don't think... The stereotype is funny, like you said, with the car salesman. There's so many good car salesmen, but then there's so many bad ones that that make the stereotype what it is. Yeah, and I mean, and that's a great industry to create a bridge between. Right. Because if if you go into an Audi dealership today, mm-hmm. or you know Mercedes or Toyota, whatever, most dealerships today, you walk in, they f- flipped the car buying experience 180 degrees because they were able to identify. That there was a stereotype that when you walked into a dealership, you were going to have a bad day. Like mm-hmm. people would gear themselves like, all right, honey, I'm going to put my shitty jeans on my broken right. up T-shirt. Yeah. So I appear like I don't have any money and go to this dealership to, right. to battle and negotiate for six hours sure. to try to get a car. And so the dealerships understood that that was not a lot of them understood that that was not going to be a, a good policy to ke- propel them forward, mm-hmm. especially because consumers are more sophisticated than today. Right. And so are real estate agents. I mean, mm-hmm. when I say consumers, that's kind of like everybody's more sophisticated today than they were even just 20 years oh, ago. Yeah. Um, people have access to more information. So no one is going to be just giving business to someone that doesn't give value. Oh, yeah. And it's so funny. My my top sales rep is this big, burly guy. And he... And I'm sure for him it's more difficult sometimes oh, to Oh, I'm to sure. Crack. Yeah. But he's, he's a machine on the phones. He uses what he's good at. And, you know, um, I think that that's... That's super important to empower the people to to combat stereotypes. I mean, in real estate, you have to combat stereotypes about real estate agents, right? That consumers hear, and it's the same in our industry. So it, it's no different. Um, but it's just, you know, I'm not this big feminist, and I'm like on all these like female things. But when I hear Title Girl, I'm like, ugh, I just cringe. Yeah, I I can see why. Yeah, um, because. It's an unfair representation of what mm-hmm. you do in business. Right. But it's a common characterization Absolutely. of the industry. Absolutely. And so there is, um, there is that. Um, but yeah, you have a lot of different sales reps. They're mm-hmm. all different walks of life. Right. They all look differently. Yes. They all sound differently. <laughs> and they all apparently have different strengths. You yes. guys do, even though you script the way the closing go- goes, you're letting your sales reps use their strengths. So they're not oh, so definitely. much scripted when they go out. They are not scripted. I mean, we have what we call our value vault or basically our success formula for real estate agents. And we have so many things that we can offer real estate agents that I train my sales team to ask a lot of questions and figure out what value we can bring to them. We don't just verbal vomit product uh, or tools because some agents just don't want that, right? They want to partner somebody that's going to help them uh, with ideas. I think the biggest thing that we've come across in most of our agents, they just want great ideas. They're running out of ideas. Um, So one thing we do is we go to all these big conferences. We go to all these big tech things or, you know, the KW conferences, the EXPs, the big Enmen stuff like that. And we just learn what's coming up in the industry and we bring it back to our team. Yeah, because, and I think part of the, that's, that's a symptom of a greater problem. Right. And the greater problem is agents are not being given enough value right. in their respective offices. Mm-hmm. So when you're a one man show, you're wearing the accountant hat, the marketing mm-hmm. hat, the listing agent hat, the buyer's agent hat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There comes a point that you just, you're just kind of going day by day through the motions oh, to sure. service the phone calls, you know, the fires that start closest to you. Uh, but there's all these other fires burning in the periphery. And mm-hmm. I think where title companies have, um, and specifically you guys have become instrumental is providing help in the areas that agents could use help oh, sure. that they're not receiving from their companies. And mm-hmm. I would argue they should be receiving it, but it's just not happening. It's just not happening. I mean, we're in such a commodity business, right? You need title insurance. Everyone's got to find a title rep to work with or a title company to work with. 
Um, but what we do is, you know, I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. So I do a lot of training because um, I truly believe that the mentality of the leader is what really helps the business grow. And I bring all of that back to my team. And one of the things I learned at the last business mastery was finding that gap. Where is that gap that your competition is not doing? And how do we close that? Um, and I think we found that gap, but we we're continuously growing that gap. So, and we're not, we're not giving up. We're always constantly adding to our value vault. Um, we want to be educators. We want to be people that are seen as value in the industry and not just a commodity like cranking out title insurance. You'll never even hear us use that word. Um, that brings me to my next point. And my next point is, First of all, I, I hugely appreciate the fact that you came in and you're like, throw all the questions at me, which by the way, is kind of the format here. Sure. Um, we just have an open conversation, but there's not enough of it happening. There's not enough of oh, yeah. this going on. There's not enough. By the way, I don't like Tony Robbins and I've been to the events and I, it's just not my thing. Yeah, but it's that does, not for everyone, right? But that doesn't mean that we can't have a chat. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we can't find common ground. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean that I'm not fascinated by a lot of the things that you guys are doing. Sure. But it almost seems like today days, everything, everybody just kind of retreats to their tribes mm -hmm. and everybody's just want to be part of the, their tribe and there's right uh, there's not enough cooperation or collaboration sure and i think that probably goes back to what we were talking about before we started rolling is there's not a lot of cooperation in the title industry and for me to be able to stay you know that positive mentality and be able to grow my business and lead my team i need my tribe would be like a tony robbins or would be some other seminar that really helps my mindset grows my business like i'm going to the rise business which is a rachel hollis event so it's not just exclusively learning from one person i take little pieces and kind of put it together and grow the team from there so my tribe are going to these other events because there are no other title agent owners that I really talk to locally. That is such a crazy Isn't thing crazy? when we were talking about it. I know. And by the way, that's the value that I find in doing sort of um, just spitballing before mm -hmm. we start rolling the camera because the thoughts get a little better right. organized for the viewer. But we have the Association of Realtors where mm -hmm. realtors from all companies and all walks of life can, you know, talk right. to each other and get to know each other and whatnot. And then you have, you know, the association of mortgage brokers where those guys get together and mastermind and talk. But is there a central Florida association of title no. companies, oh a title no. industry association of central Florida? It's that so is funny. Crazy. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And it's something I've like wanted to do. I'm super like if I told you earlier, if a title company owner called me today and said, hey, how do you guys do this? Or, you know, what net sheet uh, software do you use? Have you ever switched? I would give them the answers in a heartbeat. It's just net. There's just never been that camaraderie. Um, but now that my business is really thriving, I've got an amazing team around me that I trust wholeheartedly. I can leave my phone away for two hours and not stress out, you know, why we're doing this podcast, which is an amazing place to be. I feel super passionate about putting something like that together. It seems to me from the outside that is necessary. I think so. Um, Absolutely. Because specifically when it comes to RESPA compliance mm -hmm. and violations and, um, improprieties in the industry that handles all of the money, it would be a really good thing if someone had a forum where they can sort of close the door and say, hey guys, this week I got a complaint for this thing. And this was the interpretation on the rule that I was given yes. by by the reg regulatory because body. Because you know it's happened before um, where we've gotten a complaint and we were given a certain, you know, you have to do this. You know, we've never been fined for any complaints. We've always been able to walk through them, but it would be so they give nice. You homework. Yeah, they give you homework to do and take this down from your Facebook page, even though there's, you know, it's just an interpretation. Um, but I'm not big on interpretation. I like to press it and be like, but why? You know, why are you interpreting RESPA that way? So it would be really nice to have that sort of like closed room thing, I would be so open to it. So any other title owners, please call me. Let's put something together. And I think it would be something super resourceful for real estate agents. And, and this is the challenge. The challenge is 
it has to be something that it's done almost in secrecy. Yeah. It has to be done something that it's not like a social media opportunity or a boasting opportunity. No, no, no. Or like a, behind ha- closed doors. It and has then, to be yeah. like, hey, meet me at the back room at Christner's or whatever <laughs> and knock twice and yeah. then we'll open the door and let you in. Yes. And the reason it has to be that way because we're talking about very serious stuff mm-hmm. and it has to be that way because God forbid there's a title company where somebody's really truly funneling money out of it right. or where someone is truly um, maybe targeting agents that have a little bit of money to get on some side investment deal, sure. like something that's, that, that, that is truly well, it harmful. Would, it, that would be amazing, especially like, you know, I hear rumors about other title companies too, but I would never in a million years spread it. But if I, if we had some sort of forum like that, where I could be like, hey, I heard this, you know, you may want to combat it or, you know, how are we going to combat all these rumors in the industry? Because I think the one thing, because it is so competitive and we don't have a forum like that, people naturally lead with attacking other title companies to get business. And I tell my team, I said, if I ever hear that you are knocking competition to get business, it's immediate termination. It's something that I just will not tolerate Um, because we are always a bigger person. Um, We're not ever going to knock another title company to get business. It just won't happen. And I think if we had a forum where we could naturally talk about Respa or naturally talk about, hey, have you ever had a complaint about this? I have a title company owner in Tampa that I talk to quite often that I met at a an event and um, it was a national event in San Diego. And he's had, oh my gosh, uh, like 75 complaints last month alone wow. that he had to deal with. And this is what I have to deal with now as the owner, um, getting phone calls from underwriting. Most of the time they're, they're just very frivolous things that you just have to, you know, say something to your sales team. Don't forget a business card inside of a, you know, open house basket, like very small things, but it would be nice to be able to talk to through those things and not be so reactive in our industry, but be more proactive. Yeah. I think it's an important thing. I think it's very important for people because what happens is to try to equate it to a little bit of what happens in real estate or mortgage, what happens in real estate is like, if I get fined from the board or if the board comes after me for something, Mm -hmm. I'm generally going to have a conversation with those people who are closest to me, who I'm in competition with, by the way, um, just to tell them, Hey, careful, there's this landmine out there or careful. They're looking at this now. And for me, 100% of the time, it's never been anything that I'm doing intentional. It's never oh, yeah. been anything that I really benefited from. Sure. It's an editorial mistake. It's something that I approved for a marketing piece that I approved. And I remember that o- post t- on Facebook. Yeah, that, you that had. I approved yeah. at 1130 at night. And, you know, right. <laughs> I shouldn't be doing that at that time. Right. And it's most of the time, the simple complaints that we get about social media. It's funny. We had a complaint about sharing a open house flyer on our Facebook page, which is apparently that's an inducement to market business and open house, which buyer doesn't choose. I mean, it's just one of those things that, you know, if you wanted to fight, you could, but you're kind of like, yeah, I'm not getting business because of an open house flyer. It's fine. Um, But you know, to be able to talk to other title company owners about it, I have to call my underwriter. I have to call There's DFS. A, yeah, it's a proxy. It's a There's a whole, pro, you know, process and everyone interprets it different. They're like, well, you can say that you're going to the open house, but you can't share their flyer. And I'm like, that's marketing both ways. So you get kind of different interpretations. So it would be really nice to have like a local board for title agents. Yeah, it, it seems like it's always a conversation that's handled by a proxy. So yes. it's like you're telling your title rep and then that, you know, your um, your underwriter rep is talking to the underwriter rep for the other company. Right. So it's never a direct conversation where what it, the way that it should look like is it should look like, hey, Amanda, I just heard that you guys got fined. I just heard the FBI is there. Do yeah. you, you need me to bail you out? <laughs> no, there's no FBI yes. here. Okay, click. Right. And, and it gets squashed. Right. Well, and I think I, I wholeheartedly am passionate about that. I would love to do something like that. Because, um, again, it's no different than in real estate where you guys have to call the, what is it, legal hotline about things. And you can share it on that Orlando Mastermind group. And you may not get, you get totally different answers. It, it's just crazy. 
Yeah, the dangerous part about that is that um, in, in various groups, on whether it's Facebook or otherwise, mm-hmm. um, people are very quick to give answers that they sh- they're not qualified to give. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so that's the other part where open communication is important mm-hmm. because if you have if you have open communication amongst title companies, then mm-hmm. there is no guess game. Right. And, you know, the other end of the spectrum, and that's why I said it has to kind of be a closed door situation. Oh, because for sure. The other end of the spectrum is what happens in the real estate industry. Like someone has a question that they should be asking their broker and their broker they're, should be answering yeah. for them. But they're putting it on a public forum when they, they get and they get 37 answers. My and guess, they're, they're more confused now than they were before. Well, either yeah. that or, listen, there's confirmation bias. It's a mm-hmm. real thing. You don't ask a question about a problem without having sort of like what your preconceived solution for oh, the problem yeah. is. And so the second someone confirms that bias that you already have, that's the one that you're going to go with. This is just human behavior right. 101. Right, yeah. and that's so true. So the public forums, like... You'll see people tag me in it, and I will never, ever give advice on those public forums. It's just one of those things that can be misconstrued. One word off, it's something that I just don't like to get involved with, and I tell my team not to get involved with. Um, if it's someone just asking for a referral, obviously we'll jump in, but any specific questions, it's, you know, I just try to and then people keep get it mad very at you. PC, and they, keep, they get mad, right? They're like, Amanda, answer this, and I'm like... It can be answered several different ways. People get mad at me because yeah. sometimes, again, when I'm at 11.30 at night, I can't sleep and I decide that I want to be trolling a little bit on Facebook. <laughs> Everybody's legal question, I respond with, you probably should be asking an attorney. You probably right. should be. And so saying that is like a dirty word to people. Like, they get how upset. dare you? Obviously, you, you know. Like, right. Well, then just fucking do it. Go ask an attorney. Right. Stop asking Stop asking your Facebook friends for medical advice and legal advice. Do yourself a favor. Right. And I think that's one thing that um, I love the Orlando Realtor Mastermind, but sometimes people kind of take it out of concept. They get very defensive and it, and it's like, oh my gosh, guys, like, come on. We're like, and, and, credit i i think that's run by rick bosley yeah it's an incredible run i mean there's so many agents in there and yeah and credit to rick it is it is an impossible ask for someone to curate every post and every comment to every post um so i I, would absolutely not want to do it so so uh, so yeah i think they're doing a really good job with the Mm -hmm. forum but again as a symptom of a larger issue i think um Agents need to become better at mm-hmm. picking their brokers. Their broker can't be just your friend. Mm-hmm. It's okay if, he, if they're your friend, but they have to be someone that can answer those questions, that right. can answer the phone and answer those questions when you need them to. And brokers need to become more proactive at becoming accessible to those agents. Mm-hmm. because. Well, even if it's not the actual broker, right? They empower a team or a team lead or, or someone that can, but I think too... Um, that's another gap that I've seen in the industry. So I, how do I look at that? I look at that as an opportunity for a title company to fill in, an opportunity for us to fill in with education and new agent classes and title and contract 101. And those those to me are opportunities that I jump on right away. If somebody is going to choose 100% brokerage, I mean, you probably have to kind of know in your head that your broker is not going to be available. That's, well, that's something the crazy that, part. Yeah. That's the crazy part. The crazy part is I had Joe LaRosa. 100% guy, mm-hmm. probably the lowest cost real estate company. And this is not an endorsement. I'm not an agent with La Rosa sure. Realty, but that these are the facts. Mm-hmm. Possibly the lowest cost um, business for a real estate agent is La Rosa Realty. Joe has an incredible amount of resources. Right. Far superior than companies that are taking 20% of agents' paycheck, $25,000. Sure, $25, sure. So it's... Well, yeah, that's what, that's what I mean is like they've empowered a team and resources and things for their group, um, not necessarily coming straight from the broker, but uh, they've leveraged those things out. Yeah. And it is just a crazy thing to think about that real estate is one of the few industries where it's not always what you pay is what you get. Mm-hmm. Like the old saying, what you pay for is what you get. Like. No, it doesn't work that way. There's a lot of people paying a whole lot of money for a whole lot of nothing in this industry. Mm -hmm. So you really have to try to turn on that critical thinking chip in your mind when you're a real estate agent and understand that it is the responsibility of your brokerage to be able to answer questions and be there for you. And 
truthfully, any broker with any sense, with mm -hmm. IQ above room temperature, will be able to know that most of the questions in real estate, it's like a toothache. It always happens in evenings mm -hmm. and weekends when the dentist is closed. Mm -hmm. And so you have to just be accessible to answer those. It's, yeah. There's no excuse for brokers to just be like, eh, fuck it. They'll go into the Facebook group and ask the question. Right. Yeah, no. And, you know, that ends up falling back on the broker, right, if something happens with that real estate agent. So I think that's an incredible point. I think there's a ton of brokers that bring different values to the industry, um, some more coaching, some more training, uh, some more resources. But, you know, there's very effective brokers that have put all of those things into place, even if that single broker can't be accessible to, you know, 200 agents at one time. So I think that's super important. And even if it's for a very reduced cost. Right. I admire people that are very frugal on their business operation mm -hmm. when I'm doing business with them. Like, right. otherwise, I don't really care too much. You know, like... I love it when Toyota puts out a really crazy Super Bowl ad. I don't want them to be frugal with their marketing dollars. Mm -hmm. I want them to do like the craziest ad they I've ever seen. They just put like an orange and that, that's it. And right. you're like, what was that? But yeah. it's funny. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I don't care how frugal they are. But if, if we are in the active exchange of money, right. I definitely want you to be frugal with your money. Mm -hmm. Like I want you to spend your money wisely mm -hmm. and in things that are meaningful um, sure. to my business. Um, speaking of Super Bowl ads, mm -hmm. you are a TV star. Am I? <laughs> Talk to me. You're on a TV show, right? Tell right. me a little bit about that. Yeah. So we're on a TV show called The American Dream. Um, so it's a TV show out of San Diego that was started, uh, I want to say, about three years ago now. Um, and it's in 31 cities. So it's locally in Orlando, and we are the title sponsor for that show. So we have a video studio in our office that is utilized for the show, like a green screen room. And there are 12 what we call local power player agents that are on the show. So they work directly with the show. We just kind of come in as support. Um, and then, of course, you know, my marketing department helps with ideas for creation of the show and curation and all of that. And it is aired on Sundays at noon. Where? It is on um, Apple TV, Roku. So it is a digital version for now. And then we're hoping to get picked up on a local channel soon. Very cool. Yeah. Um, Amanda, tell people how they can find out more about Celebration Title, sure. um, your Instagram, your Facebook, mm -hmm. um, and all that good stuff. Sure. So just follow us at Celebration Title Group. And that is our handle on Instagram, uh, Celebration Title Group on Facebook. You'll see all of our events. Of course, we are very event driven. Um, one thing we did notice in the industry was that we were sponsoring a lot of events and kind of taking over. Maybe that's my D personality. So we decided to put on a lot of our own events and we're actually getting sponsors for ours, which is incredible now at this point. Uh, we are rolling out what we are calling the candy shop. I don't know if you guys have seen it dropping on Instagram. So it's our introduction into sweeter content. Um, so just kind of a play on words, but we've got a super cool lineup uh, calendar of events coming in August and through the rest of the year that you'll see on Facebook, we have built out a realtor lounge in our downtown office. So the entire upstairs of our office is a lounge area. So come in, hang out, mastermind. We have agents coming in and out of there all day long. So it's very, very cool. Go to our website, celebrationtitlegroup.com. We've got all the amazing, you know, net sheet calculators. You can see our beautiful staff all of their, um, you know, headshots and whatnot and how to contact us. So I definitely look forward to, to working with you guys. That deserves an applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for coming in, Amanda. Yes, I thank hope you we can for do having this again. me. Absolutely. That was awesome.